Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. So this is my morning. Um, you could certainly argue that we are living in the dumbest timeline imaginable <laughs> when our national debate centers on a dress that AOC wore to the Met Gala. And whether Nicki Minaj's cousin's friend got swollen testicles from taking the COVID vaccine. And I, un, un, unfortunately, Nicki Minaj, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm sorry to disappoint you, has 22 million followers on Twitter. And, and I got dragged into it because I was just sitting there. I didn't say anything. I just nodded my head when Joy Reid went off on her for spreading misinformation about COVID. And Nicki Minaj you know, went to her 22 million followers and said, look, Look what Joy Reid is doing with these two white guys nodding along. And I'm just I, I get dragged into it. So I this this happens. So, again, we, this may be the this is the world that we live in of the the intersection of serious things, popular culture, disinformation, social media. And I'm following all of this while also preparing to talk with George Will about his new book. So there's a little bit of of cognitive dissonance. So, <laughs> Mr. Will, thank you for your patience. Well, we're talking about Nicki Minaj's cousins, friends, whatever. I'm good well, morning. I, and know, <laughs> well, look, I'm glad to be with you. I I too have been wondering recently. I think I hitherto thought or assumed that the quantity of stupidity relative to the size of the population was one of history's constants. I don't think so anymore. I, I think we're we got a larger surplus of stupidity than ever before, unless the velocity that stupidity gets off social media is giving the illusion of increased mass. I don't know. What do you think? I wrestle with this. It's a it, the the question of was it always there and we're just now seeing it because it has more forums and because it has more velocity. But this does seem to be one of the paradoxes, right? We have more information, more education out there. And yet the stupidity seems like, it, like we're being overwhelmed by it. Let, let me quibble. I don't think we have more education. I think we have more years of schooling, which is different. Uh, it, it seems Fair to me point. abundant data indicate that students are reading less, writing less, studying fewer hours. Mm. Uh, you may have seen the T-shirt <sighs> that, that says college, colon. Those magic seven years between high school and your first warehouse job. Uh, <laughs> well, we can just double back on that because I want to, obviously I'm very interested in higher education. So anyway, we're, so we're living in this dumb age, and and I have to say that one of the things that surprised me when I picked up your new book, which I highly recommend, American Happiness and Discontents: The Unruly Torrent, 2008-2020, is that you you. It, it was far more cheerful than I was expecting that you write about how you go about your business cheerfully and enthusiastically after 50 years and 6,000 columns. You describe arriving at your office every morning, impatient to get on with the pleasure of immersion in the torrent. And I have to say, Mr. Will, I admire that kind of cheerfulness and resilience, given what we're going through. Well, to me, writing is an almost physical, tactile pleasure, putting sentences and paragraphs together. So uh, I, I have to write. It's a metabolic urge. That doesn't mean I'm cheerful about what I'm writing about, but I'm cheerful about being paid to do something that I do for free, which indicates the price theory has failed. I tend to think price theory rationally allocates things, but in my case, I'm being paid to do something that I did don't even need to be paid for. So you have written 6,000 columns and roughly 750 words a, 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 a column. And you know, this is an interest. I want to spend a little time before we get to conservatism and Trump and all of the other things that are there. I want to talk about, about writing because there's a lot that you write in your introduction about writing and the pleasures of, of writing. In your mind, do you have an ideal of the perfect column I mean, how do you write a column? Because there's a certain perfect, <laughs> yeah. you know, there because it is it is such a, a finite art form in and of itself. Yes, I'll give you a few of my rules. First, there's nothing in the world more optional than reading a column. And mm -hmm. people are only going to do it if it's fun. And you make it fun by having a good lead paragraph and then by packing it full of facts. I know our, our columns appear on what are called the opinion pages of papers, but that doesn't mean 
opinion is enough to carry a column. Uh, I want my readers, A, to encounter a whole lot of facts. The, the, the nicest compliment I think I've ever received was from uh, a fact checker at my syndicate who said until she started checking my columns, she had no idea how many facts there were in them. And I think that that's it's people want to learn things and and learning about Will's opinions is fairly far down the list of what they want to learn. Third, it seems to me laughter is fun. So I think people want some wit or some something amusing within the column. It can just be a phrase, can be a story. But uh, if you put all these things together and you figure out how to compress it all into 750 words, you've got a nice little craft. You, in, in your introduction, you cite a column by Murray Kempton, and I think a lot of our listeners, uh, un- unfortunately, are probably have forgotten about Murray Kempton or unfamiliar with him, but you, you quote, and, and I wanted to get some sense of, of the impact of this on, on you, the, the experience of, of opening up the newspaper as a, as a young man, reading Murray Kempton, and you quote a 75-word sentence, which is truly extraordinary as, as, as a writer, it's it's you, you describe it as an example of of trenchant elegance. Uh, could you just talk to me a little bit about that? The influ- the impact and the influence of Murray Kempton and 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 his approach to his readers. I, I guess part of it was what a compliment it is to his readers, as opposed to the current discourse, which is so much, you know, I, I think reveals so often the contempt for the look, the disdain for the the reader intelligence. Murray Kempton came from a very, very, very different tradition, didn't he? He certainly did. I mean, the the bad news, people say, is that A, most Americans don't read newspapers, and B, most of that minority who read newspapers don't read the op-ed pages. I, I find that liberating, because what it means is the readers of columns are self-selected and, frankly, are intellectually upscale, which means they bring to the page and to reading a column a fairly good stock of knowledge about history and about current events. Therefore, you don't need to use uh, much of your 75 or 750 words telling them, reinventing the wheel, as it were, every day, telling them that there are three branches of government, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that we have a small but informed and interested audience, self-selected audience, no one drives them with cattle prods to come to the op-ed page, uh, is to me liberating because I I frankly assume a lot on the the part of my readers, not just uh, their interest in their information, but the fact that they can follow, not just follow, but can enjoy a syntactically complicated sentence of the sort Murray Kempton. Murray uh, knew exactly where his distinctive style came from. He said it came from reading Lord Clarendon's history of Cromwell's rebellion. Hmm. It was about 300 years old, but uh, it, it, it was from that, Murray said, that he got his style. One of the other questions that that, that I've been thinking about lately is, you know, especially given the changing nature of uh, discourse and and reading habits, is what is the future of books? Do people have patience for books? And and you very explicitly say that, you know, despite the new media, the importance of books is increasing. I think books are still the primary carriers of ideas. Uh, a lot of work goes into books. I've published 16 of them now, and, and mm-hmm. I, I, I can appreciate that. Uh, a, a, a serious person can take three, four, five years to produce a book that can be read in 12 hours, and I'm getting the distilled essence of someone's mm. intelligence. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, so, yes, I, I think the future of the book is 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 very good. I'm addicted and have been for 40 years to to recorded books. I go through 70 books a year, 70, 80 books a year, and otherwise completely wasted time. I get up every morning at 520, huh. go in to shave, and I'm listening to a – by 521, I'm listening to a book. And I putter around to have breakfast, uh, commute to work, all listening to books. So two and a half to three hours a day of otherwise, as I say, barren time is fruitful. 
that that's fascinating. So how how do you think that listening to books is different than reading the book? Is it a different experience? Do you do you experience the words and the rhythm of language in a different way that way, or how how is yeah. it for you? Well, it, it it takes a while to rewire your brain so that uh, you're you're actually you develop a kind of muscle memory on how to mm-hmm. do this. But once you've done that, it's not so different. And and I always buy a hard copy of the of the book I'm listening to. And and if it's history, which I read most, uh, like after I've listening for a few hours, I stop and go back and underline in the hard copy of the book what I what I want to know and for hmm. future reference. Uh, it it the, the only person. This is kind of puzzling. The only person I would not listen to because I wanted to read them was Elmore Leonard, uh, the crime and novelist who was a friend of mine. Because if I listened to him, I'd say, how did he do that? (laughs) And I'd want to go back and turn the page and see how he'd he'd, he'd done something particularly elegant and nuanced. It, it, it's funny you say that because um, you know during the pandemic uh, I started listening to a lot of 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 audio books, particularly when I was walking my dog. But I always felt the need to have the the you know the hardcover book as well because I wanted to go back and forth. I wanted to be able to check what I had read, whether right. I had my my mind had had wandered. So uh, on this this issue of of enjoying commenting on the the torrent ar- around us. You, you say that it might seem perverse to enjoy writing cultural criticism at a time when the culture is increasingly coarse and silly. But one of the, the reasons why the temperature of the nation's discourse is, is so intense right now is that the stakes are high. Today's fights are not optional and they are worth winning. So what are the fights that you think right now are the most important? and that are ones that are worth winning. At bottom, it is a fight over whether or not we still believe in the American founding, by which I mean the following. The American founding asserted, A, that there is a fixed human nature. B, there are natural rights suited to people of this nature, that is, rights essential to the flourishing of people with our constant human nature. Third, uh, to that end, rights precede government, as the Declaration says, governments are instituted to secure these rights. First come rights, then comes government. Uh, and those three propositions are all simultaneously under attack from progressives who say that, A, there is no such thing as a fixed human nature. We are basically creatures that take on the impress of the culture in which we're situated. Therefore, there are no natural rights. What that means is that that rights are really spaces of autonomy granted by the government, by by government's grace, and revocable by the government. I don't know if you saw there's a this woman Wen, uh, who's a public health official, yes. mm-hmm. uh, is constantly on television on CNN, and and the the other day she was on saying, travel, interstate travel is a privilege, not a right. Well, A, she's wrong. The Supreme Court has spoken on this unambiguously. Uh, but that's the, that's the progressive mentality, is that rights are granted by government uh, as rewards for our good behavior. And third, therefore, the entire structure of government that the, that the founders thought was necessary to have a government strong enough to protect our rights, but not too strong to, to threaten them, Therefore, the separation of powers and a presidency uh, kept to normal human scale is unimportant. Uh, so th- those are, that's what I mean by uh, the stakes are high and worth winning. What do you think that the founders would think of our current political state, in, in, including the way that, that Americans regard the concept of freedom? I think they'd be bewildered because uh, increasingly Americans – think, uh, and certainly the progressive view is that, that equality is more important than freedom. And equality is to be, a, the ideal equality is everyone being equally dependent on government. Uh, and I think the founders would throw up their hands and say, where did we go wrong with this lot? The the title of your book is American Happiness and Discontent. And it, it raises the immediate question, why are Americans not happier? What is the nature of American happiness? We are prosperous. We are free by historical measures. People live good lives, and yet 
there's certainly not a lot of happiness. No one would describe the mood of America as happy right now. So and, what is, what is, and, yes. Well, it, it, and it's hard to imagine a legislative agenda that would make people happy. That yes. is, in the, in, the, in the 19th century, people argued about whether one set of human beings could own other human beings, whether slavery should be extended into the territories, what we should do with public lands, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you could figure out what big things, Missouri Compromise, Compromise of 1850, Fugitive Slave Act, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, people fought over things. Mm -hmm. Now it seems to me we're fighting over status anxieties and over the sense that one group of Americans is condescending to and despises another group of Americans, and other Americans resent this. Uh, so it, it, it's it's hard to address this with a political agenda, which is why so much of our furiousness is is unfocused today. And being unfocused, it's hard to address. You know, you talk a lot in this book about uh, about history, and 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 you and you make a point that I've been struggling to make, and you make it m much better than I do, which is not a surprise. But the the way in which you know we are very much part of the past, the past is still all around us and influences us, and how we we are still the in the you know the hangover of decades ago. So, for example, as I mentioned on a podcast the other day, we have young people who are still singing songs from 54 years ago uh, that we are still very much the the product of different generations and you tell the story about the office that you that you work in that you bought back in 1987 from an elderly woman in her 90s and she lived there since childhood and she said that her parents remembered seeing abraham lincoln's son walking past the house on his way to the corner saloon to purchase a pail of beer and it is it's it's sort of the way that our history, you know, you know, we it holds hands that we are so connected and that the past is really not that far ago, that that far, far off. It's not so long ago and it's not really dead, is it? No, it's not. It is. Faulkner famously said in his Nobel lecture, uh, the past isn't even past. And that's why it is right that we fight over history. George Orwell says in 1984, he who controls the past controls the future, and who controls the present controls the past. Uh, that's why the New York Times was cunning, if disreputable, with its 1619 project, mm -hmm. which said, let's reframe American history, teaching people that we were not founded, that we were not, as Lincoln said at Gettysburg, conceived in liberty, but we were conceived in sin, not in 1776, but in 1619, when the first slaves arrived, that uh, America was tainted from the start and has not made measurable progress since, all of which is preposterous. Uh, for example, the 1619 Project said, uh, the, the young woman who got the Pulitzer Prize mm -hmm. for putting out this nonsense, said, the Americans fought the American Revolution because they felt slavery was threatened, because Lord Dunsmore uh, the royal governor of Virginia promised that slaves who fled from their masters and fought with the British against the Americans would uh, be emancipated. Well, he said that, I think, in November 1775, after Lexington and Concord, mm -hmm. after the Boston Tea Party, after the uh, Boston Massacre, after the Stamp Act, and all of this. I mean, the war was raging George Washington was already appointed commander of the Revolutionary Army. And along comes this young woman at the Times and says, no, 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 that matters. Uh, all that matters is they fought because of what Lord Dunsmore said. It's, it's uh, historically illiterate, but nonetheless uh, effective, I'm afraid, for being that. And, and very frustrating because the, the response uh, you know, from the Trump administration was to name that 1776 commission and to regard history as, as as basically a form of feel good propaganda, when the reality is, is that history is filled with grays, and we're, we're we're it feels like our discourse is not comfortable with that. You know, the, the uh, of the approaching six thousand columns that I've written, <laughs> I have in the book 
the one that people still come up on the street and mention to me, and it's my diatribe against the plague of denim that's everywhere. <laughs> that if you're in an airport concourse and a father and his 10-year-old son walk by, they're dressed exactly the same way. Running shoes, T-shirt, denim. And if the mother's there, she's wearing a denim skirt. I mean, it's just, it's it's a plague. And this uh, uh, it, a whole bunch of my columns in the book are about parenting, about the fact that the noun parent became a verb fairly recently. <laughs> and the idea that parenting is complex, like uh, differential calculus. But if you master it, you can have, parental perfectionism and your child will go to Princeton and then on to Goldman Sachs if you do these things right, which gives rise to the helicopter parents, to the overprotective parents, the bubble wrap, as they say, of parenting, anything to, to by these risk-averse parents to keep the children from encountering failure. The problem is encountering failure is what we call growing up yes. and learning how to, how to cope with life. So these these kids arrive at college and they say, I need a safe space and protection from microaggressions and trigger warnings to prevent me from having sad feelings. Uh, and eventually these people graduate and go to work in, in corporate America and they, they bring this sensibility of exquisite brittleness uh, into the world because what happens on campus doesn't stay on campus. As a result, we have this weird uh, rise of the exquisitely sensitive mm -hmm. who, who find life threatening at every turn and uh, therefore become obnoxious and tyrannical in their attempts to police speech that might make them sad. Yes, or, or that might challenge their preconceptions. Right, exactly. So you actually devote quite a few columns to uh, colleges and universities, and, and, and you describe, you say that America's most dispiriting intellectual phenomenon is the degradation of higher education, which is being swept by two plagues to which it should be immune, fads and hysterias. This is what you're talking about, including sort of the Orwellian thought control that you often see on campuses. I know you talked about with Bill Maher on Friday night. Bias response teams and all the rest, yes, and kangaroo courts under Title IX. It took 800 years of evolution of our universities through ecclesiastical and political thickets to arrive at the great ornaments of Western civilization, these wonderful research universities. I've had the privilege of having degrees from two of the best, Princeton and Oxford. And to, it, what, what took 800 years to, to develop can be squandered in a generation. And I'm quite fearful that we're doing that. It, it's well known, it seems to me, that the radicals of the 1960s went to earth on campus, got tenure, and through the tenure system, they reproduced themselves mm -hmm. uh, to the point at which you have now a monochrome intellectual culture that, in academia that celebrates diversity and everything but thought. You, you you talked about the professor who had resigned from uh, Portland State, uh, Peter Bogosian, um, yes. and and, uh, and and you know he issued a you know a lengthy letter um, you know, which was published on Barry Weiss's website where where he talked about this this stifling intellectual uh, climate which seems the opposite of everything that academia is supposed to stand for, including its curiosity, the churn of ideas, the challenging of ideas. That's no longer the culture, in so, at least in some precincts of higher education. I think that's right. Uh, and the, the Orwellian nature is this. This is all being done in the name of diversity. Yeah. Uh, but it's actually coerced conformity. So one of the other things that surprised me about your book was your discussion of courts um, in contemporary American government. Um, and obviously the courts are, are very, very central to our arguments. And anytime there's a Supreme Court nomination, it is, uh, it, you know, the, 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 the fights are, are, are emotional, intense. And you write, many thoughtful people think the courts have become too important. I disagree. 
So I want to get, and I, I guess I was, I, I stopped and I put the book down because I think people think of, of conservatives as being very, very skeptical of activist judiciaries, uh, you know, the imperial court. So talk to me a little bit about why you think that the courts have been so important. You, you talk about the basic rights, which have been imperiled by majoritarian institutions, but protected by judicial ones. So talk to me about the role of courts and, and the way you describe them in this book. The biggest change in my thinking since I became a columnist in 1973 is about the role of the judiciary. I was, early on, part of the conservative recoil against the activism of the Warren Court, which was a bit promiscuous in right. inventing new rights and new duties and that sort of thing, and not doing judicial reasoning. I've changed my mind, not so much about the Warren Court, but as about the role of the judiciary. I think hmm. the ju judicial deference to majoritarian institutions is very often dereliction of duty. The so-called counter-majoritarian dilemma, the idea that judicial review is discordant with American values, misses a lot. Let me take a big swoop into history sure. here, if I may. Sure. I grew up in central Illinois, which was uh, Lincoln country in Champaign-Urbana. And according to local lore, it was in the Champaign County Courthouse, a great Indiana red sandstone building on a square in Urbana, Illinois, just a typical Midwestern scene. Local lore is that it was in this courthouse that Lincoln, a traveling, prosperous railroad lawyer, learned that Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas had successfully passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act. What the Kansas-Nebraska Act said was this. We have a problem about what to do about should slavery be permitted in the territories. He said, well, let's vote it up or vote it down because America is about majority rule. Lincoln's recoil against this heresy propelled him to greatness because Lincoln said, no, America is not about a process majority rule. It's about a condition liberty. And that's the difference. Courts do not exist to protect democracy, a word, by the way, that, of course, does not appear in the Constitution. It's about protecting liberty. Lincoln also said the following. He said, the, the Constitution is a frame of silver around an apple of gold. And the <laughs> apple of gold is the Declaration. And the Constitution should be read in light of the Declaration, which is a libertarian document that governments are instituted to secure pre-existing rights. So uh, I have come to the conclusion uh, some while ago, and under the tutelage of some very bright people like uh, Randy Barnett and Clark mm -hmm. Neely, who wrote a wonderful book on judicial engagement, uh, that in fact, uh, if, we, if we're to have limited government, it's going to be limited by the courts. Congress will not limit itself, and worse, Congress is going to continue uh, delegating essentially legislative powers to executive agencies, such as OSHA, such as the CDC, to give just two recent examples. Uh, therefore, since the presidency is swollen and will not limit itself, and Congress is careless and will not limit itself, if we're going to have limited government, it's going to be limited by uh, the judiciary policing the excesses of democracy. Therefore, I, I, I'm now firmly in the camp of those who favor judicial engagement for hmm. conservative ends. So what else have you changed your mind on when you, when you look back <laughs> on all the things you've, you, you have written? Are there, are, are there books that you say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I would write that book again today, or I would not write that column again today? Uh, I've changed my mind about uh, a long time ago about term limits. I was opposed mm -hmm. to them for a while and finally again threw up my hands and wrote a book called Restoration mm -hmm. Congress Term Limits and the mm -hmm. Recovery of Deliberative Democracy. I also used to be against a balanced budget constitutional amendment. I was opposed to constitutionalizing fiscal policy I, and I thought it was hard to draft it. In fact, I think you can draft an effective uh, uh, amendment. Uh, otherwise, we're never going to stop what is a galloping problem today as we ponder another $3.5 trillion in expenditures. See, I'm, for all the talk about the discord in America, and Lord knows it's real enough, I am much more alarmed by a consensus in Washington. 
It's as broad as the Republic. It's as deep as the Grand Canyon. It extends from Elizabeth Warren to Ted Cruz. And it is that we should have a large, generous entitlement state and not pay for it. Mm -hmm. The political class, which I believe is more united by class interest than it is divided by ideology, has a strong, powerful, permanent interest in deficit spending in giving the American people a dollar's worth of government goods and services and charging them 80 cents for it and fobbing a, a fifth of the cost of the government off on the unborn and hence unconsenting future generations. Uh, this is immoral. We used to borrow for the future. We borrowed to build airports and infra real infrastructure and fight wars for the future. Now we're borrowing from the future to fund our own contemporary consumption of government goods and services. That's simply immoral. And uh, I, uh, I'm now in favor of a constitutional balanced budget amendment to stop it. Well, I remember a conversation that you and I had a, maybe four or five years ago after, after the 2016 election, where I, I think we were going through the process of realizing that the number of actual fiscal conservatives in America was much, much smaller than perhaps we had imagined that both parties have de have decided that deficits don't matter. There's no constituents. And all of those politicians that we thought were committed to all of this, who had the charts and warned about the debt, th they just folded. I, they, I mean, I, I yes, it, it's, it's, it's appalling what the Elizabeth Warrens are doing or the, or the Ted Cruz's, but you know, let's be honest. It was also the Paul Ryan's. It was also other folks that, Apparently, when it came right down to it, decided that, yeah, let's borrow from the future, right? I mean, I mean, that's so like, what are there, like eight of us fiscal conservatives left in America? You know? <laughs> at most, <laughs> at most. Yes. Uh, you you, you mm -hmm. said some of these people decided that the deficits don't matter. Some of them did. There's now a new thing called modern monetary theory, which yeah. tells the political class they can do what they want to do and will do anyway, but it gives them an easy conscience about it. But it's not just that a lot of these people think deficits don't matter. A lot of them think they do matter, but they won't be here when the trouble starts. Yeah. Uh, I rem Paul Ryan sat down, as if I remember the story correctly, yep. and I think I do, he sat down mm. with candidate Trump after he'd secured the nomination and, tr and tried to explain to him with his, his short attention mm. span the realities of the budget problems in the entitlement state and, and how it was unsustainable to which Trump replied, yeah, but I won't be here mm -hmm. when the trouble starts. That's another problem. I, I, th I think there's, there's another parallel story that uh, involves Ryan where he had a similar conversation with Obama and Obama also said something similar to that. So it is sort of a bipartisan, uh, a bipartisan, hey, you know what? We have to leave this for the next president or the president yeah. after that. So we we have gone through, you know, this this discussion without really talking about uh, Donald Trump, which I find tremendously revealing and refreshing. But uh, I do want to talk about, you know, the, the role of conservatism right now, because, you know, we have watched the conservative movement uh, be eclipsed by this populist nativism, nationalism. And this morning, you were on uh, Morning Joe, and you said there's no place for conservatism in the Republican Party right now. What happened? Uh, what happened was uh, it was taken over, hijacked by this uh, this man, uh, Mr. Trump, uh, who has a an intense, inflamed, compact, attentive, and voting minority, but a, of the of Republicans, maybe a majority now of Republicans, who terrify Republican officeholders. Uh, when you have a political party whose officeholders are afraid of their voters and therefore neither respect nor like their voters, uh, you have an unstable, tense, unhappy situation. They live in terror of one tweet can end careers, one missive. What, what, one sort of sulfuric belch from Mar-a-Lago, <laughs> uh, and and for, so they're they're walking on eggshells, and it's uh it, it's not pretty, but uh, it, and and in sense it's not a political party in a meaningful sense because it is a cult of personality and it doesn't have what you call platform. Remember the the Republican platform in twenty twenty 
Yeah, they didn't bother. Was, it was yeah. Doesn't matter. He'll 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 tell us what we believe when yeah. when he thinks we ought to know it. Uh, so well, it, was, it was sort of like the T-shirt. You know, I'm with stupid. I'm just not, I'm whatever he wants. So <laughs> yeah, you exactly. also well, you also said you know that they're not just frightened. Republican politicians are not just frightened of this base. They don't like them much, and because they don't like them, they don't respect them. Exactly. Which, which I think is crucial to understanding what's going on and why it is so tension filled. That's right. And, and uh, some, there, to be fair, and it's, it's an injurious fairness, to be fair to some Republicans, they actually like Trump. They think Trump's they a, 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 an ornament to American national life. Uh, but I think most Republicans don't. They wish he'd go away, but they're not going to do anything to make that happen. So we are uh, conservatives are orphans right now um, and, and are probably going to be orphans for for some time. Uh, give me your sense of the way the Democrats are going about governing and whether or not they understand or are rising to meet the moment. The, the Democrats and, and the Biden administration, I, because I, I in, the, in the back of my mind, I'm remembering I should have I should have looked this up. I remember you being on a show and you had sort of a card of crazy ideas <laughs> That yeah. the, the Democrats needed to say, don't talk about these things because you will lose the election if you. And I think there were the things that were defund police. So have have the Democrats learned their lesson yet? No, uh, they came very close to reelecting Donald Trump with three words, defund the police. So they don't talk about it. And uh, but here's the problem. In 1933, Franklin Roosevelt had a radical program to change the relationship of the American citizen to the central government, but he just won a landslide. So he could say, well, people voted for me. Uh, In 1965, after my friend and first presidential uh, vote getter, Barry Goldwater, was defeated by Lyndon Johnson in a landslide. Johnson, with lopsided congressional majorities, embarked on completing the New Deal, as he saw it, with the Great Society, but at least he had a majority. Uh, The Democrats, with wafer-thin majorities in both houses of Congress, are rushing through a, a radical program that Joe Biden didn't campaign on this. Joe Biden, however, is going along with it, not because he's a progressive, but because he's a Democrat and he'll go where the party goes. And the party is being driven by the progressive, uh, intense, compact uh, caucus. So he's he's in in a way just in the slipstream being pulled along by this. Uh, But I think they're going to find in uh, next year in the off year elections that the, the country is very wary of this. That would seem to be likely. So this it may seem an un, this it feels like an unfair question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. So how how does this end? You know, you, <laughs> I, you, you you've you've watched the torrents of history, the unruly torrents of history. And, and 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 there have been pretty awful periods of time that have lasted more than eight years. But how does this fever end? How do we get back to some sort of sanity? Do you have a sense? Yeah, my answer may surprise you. I think we're going to be saved by boredom. I think, I'm not sure other animals get bored, but uh, human beings do, and it may be our salvation. Saturation journalism takes an issue uh, and exhausts it and the rest of us by obsessing on it. I rather doubt that even just three years from now, people are going to be worrying about critical race theory, mm-hmm. uh, our so-called racial reckoning and all that stuff. Uh, I, I just, I, I think the vast majority of Americans are not that attentive to politics, which is a sign of national health. And they are easily bored by this fire hose of, of, uh, by, by which we inundate them with particular issues. So I think people are just going to get weary of this. Uh, you know, it, it give you one example. I'm a sports fan. So I, I turned to the sports pages of my newspaper, including the New York Times. New York Times, mm-hmm. a few, uh, some while ago, was doing race in sports obsessively. Mm-hmm. And they had a story on the lack of diversity in snowboarding. 
And I said, well, <laughs> at least they got that out of their system. No. A little while later, they did another one on the lack of diversity in snowboarding, which I do think they've got out of their system because just the other day, they went on to the lack of diversity in surfing. Uh, so, oh. you know, when the sports pages are, are all race, 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 boredom will set in and will save us. I, I worry about this. I, I think you're right. I think that at a certain point, you can't keep the outrage meter, um, the intensity meter <laughs> dialed, dialed up to 15 all the time because after a point, you know, too much overstimulation is is exhausting. But I, I worry that it will be the normal Americans that become exhausted while the zealots, the, 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 the worst among us, stay completely engaged. That, yes. that, the, rash, that, the, that the rational Americans are the ones that, that tune out and drop out. Well, it's, that's, that's a problem. History is driven by intense, compact minorities. So you, in, in your book, you talk about the, the, the discontents of America, the current discontent, and you write that it will only diminish if Americans adhere to two categorical imperatives. They should behave as intelligently as they can and should be as cheerful as reasonable. Um, that's kind of a hedge, right? It, you know, we yes. want to be cheerful, but 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 only as <laughs> yeah. cheerful as as reasonable. But you point out the pursuit of individual happiness and in a more perfect union never reaches perfect fulfillment. But never mind. For Americans, the pursuit of happiness is happiness. Could exactly you right. You know, Camus, Albert Camus, wrote a essay called "The Myth of Sisyphus," and he talked about Sisyphus who constantly rolling the boulder up to, up the hill and the boulder constantly rolling down. And he said, "But one." one must assume Sisyphus was happy. Uh, oh, I sort of feel that way. You know, well, it, you know, it's the effort. The effort mm -hmm. is fulfilling. The effort is disciplining. The effort is, uh, yeah, it might someday succeed. So uh, I, I'm a, a cheerful Sisyphus, if that's it, it, not an ox a contradiction in terms. A cheerful Sisyphus as well. The pursuit of happiness is happiness. George Will, thank you so much for joining me. The book is American Happiness and Discontents, The Unruly Torrent, 2008 to 2020. And as I was thinking about 2008 to 2020, I, I became exhausted just thinking about what we, we had gone through. But it, it, is <laughs> yeah. a, it is a fantastic book, um, American Happiness and Discontents, George Will, winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. I enjoyed it very much. Let's do it again. Thank you. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow, and we'll do this all over again. 